Today is the 14th of June, 1994. We are in the home of Bernard Packard and Sarah, who is deceased, and her funeral was held today. We thought it might be appropriate to talk to some of Bernie's brothers or relatives since they have traveled so far and uh, since they might be able to share a few thoughts with respect to the things that are important in life. And uh, we may not necessarily call this an interview, but we're happy to have uh, Jay Packard with us right at this moment. Not necessarily the oldest, because I believe D is the oldest. But right. nonetheless, well, I have this little condenser mic, and I'm going to kind of turn it over and uh, and ask Jay to make a few comments. I will preface by saying that I've been told that you have two real honorable sons that you've reared and uh, taught the gospel of love and peace and happiness. And even one of them is a, or maybe two, is serving as a mission president in South America. That's one of them. One of them, that is Vaughn. He is the uh, the third child, third by uh, uh, 20 minutes. Yes. No, no, he's the, he is, yes, he's the third child by 20 minutes, and the fourth one is a twin of his. I have raised uh, four of them, and I feel successfully. Flo and I have. That's your and, uh, Vaughn is in San Diego, Chile, San Diego, Chile, uh, and will be there another, another uh, about two years. Enough. And uh, his wife and three children, Chad, e uh, Elizabeth, and Amy, uh, 15, 14, and 13. <coughs> they, uh, they, love, they love the gospel very much. Uh, they love America very much, but they love what they're doing very much. And so it their 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 faith and testimony in the gospel of Jesus Christ keeps them there working faithfully. Now, I, I want to share an interesting thing. When he first went down there, the Leonard family first went down there on that call, there was a division, there seemed to be a division or a lack of communication, cooperation amongst the bishops and the state presidents in relation to the mission president. And there seemed to be an alienation between the missionaries and the mission president. Vaughn has been very successful in turning that around and bringing about a complete cooperation. When he first went there, he ran on to 65% new member follow-away. New member loss. Back out of the church into total inactivity. And he's been able to turn that around to where there now is 80% retention of new members in the, into act activity, and it is climbing. He has cooperation between the bishops and the stake presidents and the mission presidents. They seem to love each other. Now, Vaughn took, he had, he had this going for him. He knows some of the latest technology in computer activity, plus he's an attorney, and he, he went down there with all, by the way, he went, before he went, he had a lot of ideas that seemed to be given to him, just seemed to be inspired on things he was going to try down there. And as, a, as we look back on it, it's the very things that he needed to do down there. And that tells me that the Holy Spirit was working with him even before he was certain that he was going to, he and his wife and family were going to be the ones called be, because they were only interviewed. And we're told, well, according to the way you've answered the questions, it's going to be difficult for you to get out of this one. He comically said that. And uh, it turned out that they were the ones chosen to go. And the things that he seemed to be inspired to try down there, he took with him, and all that he could financially scrape together, put together in computers. He bought he, he bought a portable portable computer and some a special printer, portable printer, and some special software to take with him. And he initiated something that hadn't been before, which was a communication between the the bishops and the stake presidents, a communication of them and their flock and 
and their progress. And it seemed to bring uh, uh, an enthusiasm down there that wasn't there before, a cooperation and a feeding of uh, each other, feeding to each other. Okay, of that's course, now that, in place. That stimulates a question, you know. Yes. Uh, the success is evidenced by, by the fruit that it did happen and that he was prepared by the Lord, as you indicate. Uh, unbeknownst to him, the Lord prepared him for that assignment. But nonetheless, can you, what's closest you can come to putting your finger on what he did in a practical way or a spiritual way or a combination to cause that specific change in behavior? Right. He changed behavior. He was an instrument in the hands of the Lord in changing behavior, and he had some kind of a, a, a plan, a program uh, within the, the area. How did he do that? Can you put your finger on it? One thing for the bishops and state presidents is that he held regular meetings and he printed out agendas and mailed or delivered them, got them to all of the leadership, agendas of coming events, so that they were all informed beforehand so that they then could pray and receive, receive communication for input at these meetings. That is one thing that helped. But the main thing that he helped in retaining the new members was that he initiated this. As quick as they were brought in to the fold, he gave them jobs and urged all the bishops to give each one an assignment. Nothing to frighten them, but something that they could do that didn't, uh, that, that, uh, where they felt needed, not only wanted, but needed. And, and he, he put that in place and one other thing he did that, that, that has caused the retention and uh, an actual increase of new members. Uh, that was the new thing that he did was uh, to each new member, he had them sit down with leadership, with guidance, and fill out a family pedigree sheet. And then and name all of the, their, their, their uh, close relatives member or not member and most of them were non-members, named them and put them on this pedigree sheet, and then taught, he taught them the, their individual importance and started showing them how to prepare them to come into the fold and go to the temple to be sealed together. Okay, well of course that arouses another question. He was a mission president. Yes. And there were stakes in that area of course. Yes. And of course, he had the he had the challenge to not step over the boundaries of the other uh, of the stakes, mission versus stake. You know that's always been the case. Right. That's they should work as a team and uh, marry each other in love, but they do not step over and usurp any authority. I'm wondering now that aroused the question. Yes, and that's one thing that he did. He met with them individually and let them know that they are in charge, okay. that the state presidents are in charge, or that the bishop is in charge, and that he and all of his, his uh, purpose and efforts was to assist them. Uh, that, in, that, that would keep them stepping on their toes. Yes, of, uh, to assist them, and it, it's, it's what stimulated cooperation. Uh, they at first feared him, that he might exercise power and authority over them, and as quick as well, he first, the first thing he did is he called them to a, a, a big meeting. Well, invited and him or he said, or he, asked him. Yes, he did right that. at the beginning he said, I felt, I felt the, re the resistance, the coolness. And he says, by the time 20 minutes was gone, he said, it was gone. It was warm. And there was a feeling of love and cooperation that stayed and has, has increased over the months, months and months. So they don't have a temple there yet, do they? In there, do they? In that area. I don't. They do have. They do. Some place down there, yes. Well, anyway, within range, or flying range, or, or wherever. Yes, yeah, they 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 do have a temple, and and they are to prepare their families, their people, for going to the temple. Okay. And then they they have out of each ward, uh, uh, people who are assigned to help them. Mm -hmm. So, so I believe you could uh, more or less summarize and say that he, he did everything in his power to enlist their 
cooperation in his uh, inspired suggestion that they do work or something with their hands, whether it's uh, chopping cotton on a welfare farm or canning peanut butter. If or working something. within the ward, some or kind of a, something, uh, something to do. Tangible. Mm -hmm. Pass out the, the song books, help clean up anything that they could do in the, for the W O R K. Yes, for the members. And the idleness uh, something is, of responsibility. Well, I like that. We've always been taught that principle. It's a matter of implementing, right? Yes. Okay, now uh, Jay, uh, kind of a change of subject question. We we have all observed from a distance uh, the Packers. Uh, 16 or 17 children. 17 children. Yeah, and uh, Bernie has always told us he was 15. But the thing that's uh, significant to anyone with even 30-30 uh, vision is that the, 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 the brethren and the sisters are just definitely dedicated committed and love the gospel, love the Lord, love the Savior, and they uh, want to raise and rear a righteous following of children and posterity. And uh, it's, if, if you had a half a dozen of those, or you had a few, scattered few, you'd say, well, that's the mill of the run. But when you have compound that with virtually every one of them, there is something distinct that went back. That happened. That happened. Now, the, the golden key, or the thing that caused that to come about, we always think in terms of your blessed mother, yeah. that she is the one that brainwashed you with righteousness. And when I talked to Bernie before he married Sarah, I said, uh, I talked to him in terms of marriage in the future, and he said, when we have children, I will brainwash them with the gospel principles. And he did that, and it worked. Now, I guess he gleaned that from his mother's, uh, you know, mode of life. Now, I keep thinking maybe there's something we're missing that happened other than your mother's uh, great spirit and motherly love and devotion and diligence and work. I guess if you'd look at her hands, literally, they would be down to nubs. <laughs> if, if the high hearts, I can see her working in the sewing machine or whatever she did. And then out of one quarter of the mouth while she was doing that, she was giving counsel. I can see that. Your dad was away a long time. And I know he had a stabilizing effect, effect on the children. But you don't see this one in 10,000, one in 100,000, precisely the same duplication as the Packers. And I'm not flattering y'all in saying that, but I'm uh, aware of it. I appreciate it, how closely knit you've been. And yet, I would like to really put my finger on what really, what spelled the difference. What did they do that worked? What did they do that worked? I know now, I've already heard, that whenever you had an MIA party, a scout meeting, or an outing, you were all there. And you carried out the spirit of the meeting. Okay. Let's well, that, that's still not the answer I'm looking right. for. Well, maybe I, can, maybe I can touch on it. You let me know if, if, I, if I do, if it is correct, then I can go ahead and expound on it. All right. First of all, I'll start out, out this way. Every dad and mom has only a certain distance into life to be successful with their children. Uh, the boys and the girls makes no difference. Successful because they are teachable mostly when they're young. If the dads and the moms work together as a team and not, not allow a child to put one against the other, therefore dividing the parents for the benefit of the child in a form of, of laziness or rebellion or whatever. If, if, they, if the dads and moms work together in a team, that l tends to give security to the children and begins to teach them of what is important. So then their minds and their hearts are unto dad and mom. They watch, they listen, they look. And it is usually what dad and mom does that's more powerful to them than what they say to do. And so when we, when it came time for us to do a little work, Dad being 20 miles away, working at the railroad companies uh, to, to assist the family, Mom was home with us kids, and we'd go out in the fields and work. 
And mom worked with us. Whatever it was we had to do, whatever had to be done, plant a garden, on us a team, uh, uh, work with the, with the turkeys or chickens or the cattle, uh, how to milk a cow, how to harness a team, whatever, mom did it with us. Mom was the one that was well, mainly and, teaching us. And she was uh, in action, I say, but how was her mouth working? Was okay. All right, now here. Simultaneously. They, remember I mentioned that it is what they do that has more power of teaching, long-range oh, teaching, okay, okay. By than example. anything else. Yes, by example. What is important to dad and mom? So that, there's where the kids pay attention. And so as mom was working, she was dedicated to the work. First of all, she knew how to work. I used to marvel how she could make a pitchfork, pick up the hay, the straggling pieces of the hay, and do it so easily, or make a hoe or a shovel work so effectively next to the plant, not kill the plant, but get the weeds, and loosen up the soil. She, she didn't have wasted moves. First of all, she knew her job. That the next, she made the job fun by telling us gospel stories out of the Old Testament, or the New Testament, or out of the Book of Mormon, while she was working, and she would tell us, now, you, in order to keep up with the story, you've got to be close enough to hear, and you've got to, you've got to bring up your assigned row and keep up with me. Now, we'll work with you to, so that it's fair between you and the older ones. And then she would say, now, D, you step over and you, help, you occasionally help, help J so they can keep up. And same with Beth and Cleo. You help her on her row. And mom would go ahead and work as fast as reasonable for her, which was usually fast, and she would be telling gospel stories or a story out of her past up in Canada. That had she, a moral to it. Yes, that, had, that, that was constructive, that had morals to it, and that had the gospel in it. And, and whether it was a, an experience out of her life or her early life, it always some way related to today and today's needs and gospel, the use of the gospel. So it became powerful, really, in our lives. And we forgot about the fact that we were working and our t muscles were getting tired. We were listening to something that was interesting. And Mob would bait us this way. She'd say, now, when we get done, I've got a treat for us in at the house. And this evening, we're going to get together and we're going to play games. We'll have a good time. Oh. And that became exciting to us. A kids. tradition? A tradition. It happened. And it's going on with Bernie yeah. and Sarah. Yeah. yeah. Oh, hey, he's followed through with it. So has Bill and his family, Vaughn and his, me and mine, every one of us. So when we get together in a reunion, what do we want to do? We want to discuss gospel and gospel principles, and we want to play games. When you got done. I've heard it over and over, Cleo, Cleo when she was here. <laughs> yeah. Said, I'm done. Yeah, I'm done. I heard that phrase once. I hold it many times. Well, yeah, I'm done. I'm done, yes. And not I finished, I'm through. I learned years later that that meant cooked, well cooked. But no, yeah, no, it, yeah. was, it was done. Okay. And if we were butchering a hog, scraping a hog, or uh, rendering fat, whatever we were doing, Mom made it fun, or canning fruit, or into the, the cherry trees, picking cherries, it became fun. And I, I, I mention Mom more than Dad because Dad was, uh, and on all of the weekdays, he was 18, 20 miles away from us working hard and would come home dirty. And Mom would urge us, now start the chores, chores a little bit early this evening because Dad's going to be home. He'll be tired and dirty. He'll want to wash up, and we want to get together for a family evening. Now, this was before the church initiated family home evenings. But we would get... You were talking about a long time ago. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, hey, I'm 73. I'm 73. And when we were young and on the farm, Dad and Mom were teaching us the way to go because they knew it worked. It worked with them when they were younger. Apparently, it, they brought the best of what they received out of their dads and moms and brought it on down, put it to work on us. Well, your and mother, what size woman by weight and height? Mom was about about uh, five foot two, and maybe weighed a hundred and two. She little was, bitty. Mom was a little bitty woman, but she was raised in Canada with mainly brothers, mostly brothers, and she rode horses in in races to to get money uh, for the family to keep her older brother Irvin on a mission. She broke broncs. 
Lamond would ride them once and she would finish them and then they'd sell them to cavalry, the Canadian cavalry, and uh, to get money for the family. Mom was a hard little wiry That's woman. Out of context, isn't it? I mean, women don't do that. Yeah, women don't. Now, let me tell you a little more about that unusual woman. That, uh, 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 yeah, women, women don't act that way, don't do those things. Well, Mom knew how to, how to uh, build a chicken coop. She taught us kids. She, <clears throat> at one time, now this is, this is true as we're sitting here, at one time, she was over in the middle of the chicken coop. We were building a chicken coop because we had five separate uh, uh, rooms that we, we could uh, uh, house chicks in various stages of growth so that we could cover the market month after month after month of, with fryers or with layers, whichever we needed. Mom was, was snaking one by fours up onto the roof and were laying, laying them across the rafters, and Dee was nailing the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, lathing. The laving, it's called laving down. It's the one before is spaced every so often uh, that the shingles are then later nailed to. I was over at the end trying to nail where, where they had already covered. They were only nailing the two ends of the boards, and I was to come back along in between and nail them. Well, the nails we got from, from the PFE shops where Dad worked, that they were scraped up uh, uh, around out of junk piles, they were bent nails, and, and uh, uh, with a few good nails in it that just happened to fall to the ground from work, and the day's work, nails. rusting nails. And he, would, uh, he was allowed to bring home a keg of that every now and then. So us kids, in the meantime, would take a little piece, a, a two-foot-long piece of railroad iron, regular railroad iron, and we would sit down there with, with leftover hammers, and we'd bang those nails and try and stay, straighten them sting our fingers and our thumbs and sometimes hit our thumbs trying to get those nails straight and when we'd get them straight they'd go in another box well you know if you've ever uh, uh, tried to use a bent nail that had been straightened once it's bent it'll bend, again. it'll bend again much easier than the first time right okay well the hammers that we had were hammers that were thrown away at the PFE shops B broken handle or the head was worn down, or it was a shingler's hatchet that no longer had the, the knurling on, the, on the, the hammer end. It was smooth. Those are things uh, with a, for a handle was a branch out of a tree hung in there, or a piece of pitchfork handle. Uh, whittled down. To whittled down until it became the handle. Well, things weren't always hung just right. We, we did the best we could. So that's what I was using to pound these bent nails into this hard lumber with dry leftover uh, lumber that we got for free or with little cost here and there, uh, leftovers from this job or that job. She watched, Mom uh, watched me from a distance bend a nail over and then with this, uh, this old shingler's hatchet try to straighten it up and get it back, back straight enough to drive it on again. And I was hassling it over and over and over. And, and I couldn't get that darn nail in. She came down there, walked the rafters, and spread it over there until she got to me, and she says, here, give me that hammer. She took the hammer, and she, she pulled the, the, in some way she got that bent over nail out. She says, give me a nail. And I gave her a nail. I thought I'd be nice to her, and I gave her one of the good nails that hadn't been bent. Because after all, she was helping me, and I didn't want her embarrassed. Well, she started that <clears throat> that hammer, uh, that nail, with two quick clicks, and then she came back in a full swing, and she had a, a way of of flexing her wrist. We called it wrist snapping, and she sn wrist snapped that that nail down flush to the wood, and left a hammer mark in three quick licks. And she says, there, that's the way to sink a nail. You drive a, a nail, you, drive, you swing like a, a hammer right. like a damn woman. <laughs> that's literally what she said. You swing a hammer like a damn woman. And then she got down the ladder and went back to the kitchen. <laughs> and left you with a challenge. D and I, yeah, we're, we're looking at each other. And, 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 you know, I thought about that so often. But I believe the Lord gave her a little help there. 
because it's still hard to do. Yeah, yes, but then Mom told us a story of how how we had that big Buddha and the three Cupid dolls that sat on top of the piano that took when we were around the piano and rehearsing a song or just singing for the pure enjoyment of it. Mama and Beth at the piano, uh, Mom instructing us, and all of us lined up around the piano singing the harmony. We would sing these songs. Well, Mom was telling us one day after we had sung so nicely that she says, let me tell you a story where Big Buddha came from and, the, and where these Cupid dolls came from. So we sat on the old dirty mohair car, uh, 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 couch and Mom pulled the, the piano stool over there and rolled it up, uh, turned it up, spun it up and started telling us this story about a time when Dad and she went to the carnival in Nampa, 20 miles away. And, and, and this, this carny, she called him a carny, was calling out his, his message to the public Sink an ale in five licks and you win, you win a prize. Sink it in three licks and you win, you win a Cupid doll. Uh, or the big, uh, do it, three, three, sink three nails in three licks and you win the big prize, the big Buddha. Well, see, Mom was telling us how she got those three Cupid dolls and the big Buddha. Well, Dad, it was, cost 50 cents to try it. Miss Carney coaxed him in to try it. Dad knew that he could do it. And what they were was 16-penny box nails into a great big hard 6-by-10 uh, uh, timber. He sunk three real quick and easy. And while the Carney was barking out to the public about the man's success, he was swinging on the second one and had it down. And then the third one, he won that, that big Buddha so quick it surprised the Carney. And then after that, uh, and in doing this, he won a Cupid doll and the Big Buddha. And then Mom wanted a partner for her Cupid doll. She wanted a, the blue one and the red one. So Mom says, let me try it. And the man got all delighted about that. He says, lady, I'll give you seven licks. For seven licks, you, you sink the nail in seven licks and you win the Cupid doll. But he says, now if you get in trouble, I'll give you a couple extra licks for an extra quarter. And so Mom got started, and she sunk it in three legs, just like Dad. She used the same wrist action that Dad did in snapping. You know, when you're making the arm swing of a hammer or a hatchet, you've got the strength and the speed of the swing. But if during the last part of that swing you, you, you rock your wrist, you speed up the, uh, and increase the power of that, that swing. I don't know what percent, but it's considerably. And that's how Mom learned to do it, clear back in Canada. And then, then working with Dad... You didn't lose the talent when she got to America. No, no, no. She worked all her younger life, shocking grain, building things, uh, and riding horses. Mom was a hard... Uh, uh, Mom was capable of doing the hardest of work that men do. Milking cows, harnessing teams, working them, working equipment and all. She could do that. And, and Mom was eager to teach us kids the, the right way to work and make it easy and fun. But she made it fun by promising reward afterward and telling us stories, good stories, during and working with us. And we would take a picnic lunch out into the field that made it all so fun. And she would sit on the... On the on the ditch bank with us kids and so have you're a picnic saying, lunch. Jay, that you're saying that uh, the family as a whole, all through the years, because they started real early, day one almost, that they really and truly did not resent work. They did not manifest any uh, uh, lack of love for, you know, work per se. In fact, on the other hand, they really enjoyed work because of two or three things. I'm, I'm summarizing what you said there. One is she worked with you, yeah. and she was always with you or ahead of you. And, and two, she offered a little reward and recreation at the conclusion of the activity in the form of treats or uh, games. Yes. And I, I've noticed that that's whenever Bernie had his family come down they go to 2 and 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning, games. 
that I didn't know how much of a tradition it was till you shared that with me. Let me let me change just a little, Jay. I want to ask you, <coughs> with your four kids, or you and your wife, of course, being reared that way and being, uh, you have to have some things that are distinctly part of you. Uh, you brought with the, from pre-existence, as they, as uh, your mother did, and <coughs> even though you carried on the traditions, and uh, you love the gospel because your family loved it, and all and all and all, still there are a lot of things that you picked up and gleaned, and concepts that you you impregnated your family with. Now, as far as trying to be successful and being successful, even if you've had some. Uh, reverses or maybe you feel like if you had it to do over again you'd maybe make a little alteration. Would you share what you think definitely worked with your kids and what you think might be a little bit area of wondering? Uh, just just uh, from the things you reflect. I don't think why I was successful with my point. Yeah, and, and uh, if you had it to do over again, would you do anything different? You might be afraid to because you worked it worked out good. But I, I reflect, I know what I would do. And maybe I won't share it here, but I, I know I'd make a few changes. Uh -huh. You know, I'd be more, I'd put in more individual time with each uh, each child on a one-to-one -one basis and let my hair down. Okay. Yes, I would I would make one major change if I could do it. But, you know, life is, is one trip around. One trip. You can't, it's not like the, the video. You can back it up and run it through again. Or you can freeze it, stall it here, and, and uh, uh, wait for a minute, think it over, and then go on, or back it up and start over. It, it, it's one time through. Uh -huh. If I could rerun it, though, I would just get myself in line sooner. I would start sooner to working with my children, because I was, I was totally inactive for, for many, many years. Okay, and I married a Catholic girl. Oh, I see. I, I I wasn't fresh on that. I uh -huh. Bertie probably told me, but I didn't know. Okay, I married a Catholic girl, and she didn't know anything about the gospel at first. So I had the freedom to go ahead and indulge in in tobacco and drinking and swearing and coffee uh, um, and and beer and wine, and unrestricted because I was in California, not in Idaho, where relatives uh, were and where uh, where people knew me. I was with Flo and her people, and they all did things like that because the Catholics are not forbidden That's from right. doing things like that. <clears throat> and Flo didn't know that I was doing wrong. <clears throat> she didn't know what a Mormon was. Now, I was, I was totally inactive. And uh, when, when I first married her, or asked her to marry me, I told her that I was a Mormon, and she didn't know what it was. She didn't think it could be all that bad because she hadn't heard of it. But later on, out of the love of dad and mom, when they came from Idaho to visit us, they found out what ward district, or what state we, region we lived within, and she, they, dad arranged it for our, my church records to be moved from Idaho to that state. That, that unleashed uh, home teachers and visiting teachers to come and see us. And before long, Two state elderly state mission missionaries came while I was at the studio. I worked at Metro Gold Mayor Studio at the time making pictures. And <clears throat> and while I was at work, Flo was listening to these missionaries and she learned about the Mormons. And you know, she believed. And she asked for baptism. And after she learned how I was supposed to be living, then she began to get after me. She called me a hypocrite one day. Because Dennis came, Flo then got active in, in primary and teaching primary and took in, taking the children to primary. And Dennis came home from primary one day crying. And, and Flo wanted to know what was the matter with him. He said, today we learned what happens to, to uh, people who get married and sealed together in the temple. And I want to know what's going to happen to me. And the rest of us. That's your son? Yeah, my oldest son. What's going to happen to me and the rest of us? And Flo told me that story when I got home, and it cut right to the core. Because he was crying. He cried himself to sleep that night. And uh, I realized that I was going to have to make a change. 
and it, the change wasn't easy. But I don't want to, do you want me to tell you about what, ch what all changed me? It's a long story. Or sh do, you, sh do you want me to tell you what I used on my four sons to make Eagle Scouts out of them, Duty to God Award winners out of them, to make all four of them Individual missionaries? Awards. Yeah, that's right. All four of them missionaries? All four of them successfully married to, to good people, raising good children. I, here's, here's the key thing All right. that I did that if I was to do it over again, I would have merely started it sooner by correcting myself sooner. But I would do the same thing. Regardless of what age they were, I played with them. Oh, okay. Now, now we're getting down to uh, the nitty-gritty. Yeah. De regardless of what age they were, I played with them, and I made myself have fun. Okay, now you played with them. Can you describe specifically the, the, the type of uh, amusement or whatever you did with them, how, how close you were intimately related to them in... Uh, your relationship, I'll, uh, okay. father to son. All right, I'll, son. I'll graduate it from our beginning things right on up to the point where my oldest son was at, at Stanford University and his crises came. And I'll, and I'll explain what caused him to come to me for help. And that is what a parent needs, is when the crisis comes... He needs his son or his daughter to be willing to come to him or to her rather than to his peers. Or Not her because peers. you had a higher IQ. Right. Because I didn't. Or, or I didn't. My kids were smarter than me. Oh, Flo and I both knew that. And so, so I knew that I needed to do something that would make it possible for them to receive high education because they were smart. They were. Dennis came out of Stanford straight 4 0. He received their highest award. Well, I was lucky to get out of high school. I hated studies. I, I never did learn what X equals. Never did. I didn't care what X equals. I never figured I could use it. I never have. Well, anyway, back to what, what we played. The first, one of the first games that I can recall is a little, <coughs> little unit out of hardwood that held... Uh, it stood on four four separate legs, quite a sturdy outfit. It had a little uh, little wooden mallet, and it had one, two, three, four, about four or five uh, uh, rows of holes, with a peg that was split at both ends, uh, and uh, uh, to where it flared it out very slightly. And you could start the peg in the hole, and then you have to pound it through. You pound each peg through the hole, and then you turn the unit upside down uh, on the, the, the opposite direction, and it stands on the opposite ends of the same four legs, and you've got the same pegs to drive all over again. Each peg was colored different, and we kept score on how many pegs we successfully drove down in, how, in three licks each peg. One, two, three, and get it down, and then go to the next one. And and for each peg that you it was a pointless game. Pointless game, yes. But right, but it was it was a, a fun contest game. Okay. And each got to participate in it to the to the level of their ability, and we kept fun scores on it. And next, the next game that we went into was marbles. And we made up our own games, and we would play for Keats. We Susan, would, yes, yes. They're anxious for you. Who is? To go. To leave? Yeah, they're supposed to leave at four. I see. Okay, I, I'll be right out. Let let me let me let me bring this story to a close, and it's a beautiful story. This way, over the years, I talked with my sons. They learned that they could talk with me on any subject. Oh, we are late. Are we? We are late. You're not going to make this plain, sir. <laughs> oh, they talked with us on any subject. So when the crucial subject time came, the dentist came to me and asked for permission to smoke marijuana because all the kids at Stanford, all the professors were doing it. He asked for my per permission, and I told him I w I'll give him my permission on one condition. That is that you promise me you'll never do it without me. Never without me. We'll, keep, we'll rent a room at the Tiki Motel. We'll keep notes on each other. And, and, and I said, 
When you get the stuff and you're ready to go I'm on it, to, let I'm me know. I'm going to...